We begin today with an escalation of the dispute between the US and Saudi Arabia over oil production. Saudi Arabia's energy minister has blasted the release of emergency oil stocks by the Biden administration, calling it an attempt to manipulate markets. The Saudis also called themselves the mature side in the standoff, comments that fuel a war of words between the White House and Riyadh after a decision earlier this month by the Saudi-dominated OPEC Plus group of oil producers to curb production. They're cutting it by two million barrels a day starting in November, precisely the opposite move that the White House wanted to see. Last week, U.S. President Joe Biden announced he would release another 15 million, million barrels from America's strategic oil reserves. That's a supply of oil that the United States holds in reserve for use during times of emergency. The White House was infuriated by the OPEC Plus decision and accused the Saudis of aligning themselves with Russia in the war on Ukraine. Since the invasion of Ukraine began in February, Russia's importance in energy markets has been reaffirmed by the International Energy Agency, which said the global oil market will still need Russian oil to flow, even with the planned price cap being imposed by the US and Europe as part of their sanctions packages. The G7 nations supported the price cap as a mechanism that would allow Russian oil to continue flowing, but at lower than market prices. But China and India have not signed on to the idea, raising questions about its ultimate efficacy. With China and India large purchasers of Russian crude, Moscow could evade the price cap by shipping most of its oil to countries that do not enforce the sanctions. With the approaching winter, demand for energy is, of course, expected to increase in the Northern Hemisphere. And President Biden has his own anxieties about the price of petrol at America's pumps ahead of midterm elections in just two weeks' time. For more on all of this, I'm joined from Riyadh today by Colonel David Desroches. He's a professor at the Near East South Asia Center for Strategic Studies at the National Defense University. Uh, Colonel Desroches, thank you very much indeed uh, for being with us today. I mean, the Saudis uh, are accusing the United States uh, of trying to manipulate the markets. The Americans, of course, would argue that it's OPEC plus that is manipulating the markets. This seems to be, at the very least, uh, a total rhetorical standoff between Washington and Riyadh now. Well, I would say it's a standoff. It's it's uh, it's an opportunity. I, I, I don't see, quite frankly, why um, the Saudi oil minister chose to intervene at this time. The amount of money is or the amount of oil being released is less than six days of uh, price cut production. It's really a trivial amount. And it's for distribution within the United States, uh, basically trying to drop uh, gasoline prices in the United States, probably in the run up to the election. So. Um, I, I think that this would have been a good opportunity to just stay quiet. Um, I think that the domestic critics of President Biden have enough to say about this in a way that Biden will pay attention to. And quite frankly, it's going to make it harder for the two sides to reconcile, as they inevitably will have to after the uh, midterm elections are over. But, but what does that reconciliation look like? I mean, it's just a matter of weeks since President Biden took an enormous uh, geopolitical gamble. That picture of the fist bump with Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, uh, the man, of course, accused by American intelligence of being the architect of the murder uh, and dismemberment of Saudi American journalist Jamal Khashoggi, uh, an effort that the United States was making to breathe some fresh life into what had become pretty chilly ties between Washington and Riyadh. Uh, and now the White House definitely feels as though the Saudis have pulled the rug out from beneath Joe Biden. So what does the path to reconciliation after the midterms look like? Good question. Well, first, both sides, I think, need to take a look at what each side actually has done uh, and what each side wants. I think
What we have here is a lot of misperception. Um, Joe Biden, in going to Riyadh, think thought that he did a great favor, uh, you know, sort of wiped the slate clean. But as soon as he emerged from his meeting, he he said, oh, yeah, I raised this issue with Jamel Khashoggi. Um, from uh, the Saudi perspective, I think they said, OK, any benefit this this trip has has just been negated. So, um, you know, Joe Biden irritated his base uh, you know, made it what I thought was a bold geopolitical move. But then in the Saudi eyes, that didn't count for anything because of his remarks immediately after it. By the same token, the Saudis, who seem to want to keep gasoline prices in the United States high in order to inflict political pain on President Biden in the midterm elections, have miscalculated that all of America or almost all of America is behind the effort to resist Putin's colonial uh, war in the Ukraine and that high energy prices are seen as uh, Putin's number one um, weapon. The Saudis have misjudged that. So both sides have to come to a recognition of the true uh, positions of their other sides. And I think that, uh, quite frankly, this is an opportunity to just shut up and let, let events take their course for a little bit, do a reassessment, and then come together. And what of the pressure uh, that President Biden is feeling uh, from some of his fellow Democrats on Capitol Hill uh, who are making moves to try and propose an embargo on fresh weapon sales uh, to Saudi Arabia? Yeah, good question. So uh, this is something that the Saudis often miss, which is President Biden's party contains a large and uh, after the elections, it will probably be a larger percentage of members who don't want to sell weapons to uh, any country uh, that has a poor human rights records and certainly don't want to sell weapons to Saudi Arabia. Um, and, you know, to be fair, uh, there's already been numerous examinations of the weapons. And even, you know, Senator Menendez, for example, said unless these weapons are needed. So the weapons that are actually being sold, like Patriot anti-missile defenses, um, those will continue to go on under most proposals. But just speaking these words, you know, putting this on the table, it makes the Saudis nervous and it makes them wonder if, you know, perhaps they should diversify their sources of supply. Uh, weapons shutoffs have been proposed many times in the past for many countries. It's very rare that the United States has gone through with it because when we look at it, we only sell countries weapons that we think they need. Countries don't get everything they ask for. Uh, and, and I know this is unusual. People don't see that. But generally, countries ask for more weapons than the United States is willing to sell. It's not the other way around. So, again, this is something that perhaps once the heat of the election is over, uh, you know, if people don't say anything that will be too hard to take back, we can have an honest assessment of our goals and our, and our relationship, which the relationship is more than oil. Fascinating days in the relationship between Washington and Riyadh. Yeah. Colonel David Desroches uh, of the Near East South Asia Center for Strategic Studies at National Defense University. Thanks very much indeed uh, for joining us Thank from you. Riyadh. I hope we'll see you again. You, you shall. Thank you.